today's video we're going to approach in a little bit of a different format so we're going to have six creepy stories found online whether they're true or not is up to you the listener to uh, to let me know in the comments below i suppose but uh, let me know if you like this format it's a story reading format more so than a video shared format so uh, hit that like hit that subscribe let me know what you think of the stories and uh, thanks for watching I know I have bad habits. You would think I would be more careful keeping my doors locked and shut in my cheap off-campus housing, but I live on the second floor. I know all my neighbours well, and they know my little terrier Mix Missy. She's loved by everyone. My nighttime routine is much like I assume everyone else's is, with the one addition of a dog owner, letting them out to go to the bathroom. I get a glass of water, wash my face and begin to brush my teeth, then open the door and let Missy out. She knows the way down the stairs into the grass and will run back upstairs when she is done. However, I leave the door open. I know this is a terrible habit, but my safety has never been a serious concern as my community is gated and again, I know my neighbours. But that night, something followed Missy back inside. When Missy ran through the door, she was only steps in front of the thing. I didn't see her come in, but I saw it. Canine, slender, pointed muzzle with brown, sandy, mange-ridden fur as big as a Doberman, but lower down to the floor. It looked almost sheepish, like it knew it had wandered in somewhere it was not supposed to. It moved slowly, head swinging back and forth, barely off the ground, observing everything. Missy looked up at me before dashing into the bedroom, ready for our routine of cuddles before sleep, and this thing crawled in after her. As it pulled its body into my apartment and rounded the corner into my room, I got a good look at it and how it moved. Broken, haphazard steps, as if its legs had been hit by a hammer. Each step drew its ankles out to the side, and I remember wondering briefly how it could even walk like that. Was it in pain? But then, as it stalked into my bedroom, head and body still lowered to the floor, it looked at me, and pulled its lips back into what I can only describe as a smile, licked its lips and slipped after Missy. All of this happened in about 30 seconds, but I bet every single one of you think you would leap into action if you saw this abomination waltz into your room. But I didn't. I froze. Perhaps with Missy's total disregard of the creature that calmed me to, the, to an extent. Perhaps it was just the absurdity of such a thing walking into my house as if it owned the place that blocked my mind from leaping into action. But I froze. Only when it was out of sight did my instinct to protect Missy leap into full gear and I bolted to my bedroom door, throwing it open to confront this, whatever it was, and get it away from my dog. However, as the door crashed into the wall behind it, I realised it was much too late. Missy had assumed her normal position at the head of my bed on the opposite pillow, and the creature was curled up behind her, wrapping its too long body around her little one, and gently laid its head down in front of her. Once again, I was met with total confusion on how to react to this. Missy didn't acknowledge the thing wrapped its round her body at all, even as, as it adjusted. Eyes locked on me at all times. What would you have done? After quickly assessing this new development to the creature, I seemed to have let it into my house. I did the only sensible thing. I called Missy over to me. But unfortunately, for anyone that owns a small dog, you know that they are very set in their routine, and Missy's routine told her it was bedtime. And instead of coming to my call, she simply buried her head in the blankets. I snapped at her, but it did no good, as she only hunkered down further to avoid the harshness in my voice. The thing, however, laid its head along her back, and once again raised its lip into that sick mockery of a smile and exposing its rot-ridden teeth. I had to do something. My phone was on the pillow beside Missy, too close for comfort to that thing on the bed but my adrenaline was racing. I was certain I could shoot my hand out, grab it and retreat before I had the time to get its teeth into my skin. I began to move along the wall, slowly as to not startle it, talking to Missy as I moved, who still had not acknowledged its presence. I was almost at the head of the bed. The thing smile grew wider and wider. Its mouth was so big. And as I neared the pillow, preparing to bolt for my phone, 
This thing, the creature from hell, lowered its jaws around my little pup's head. I froze again. It smiled, wider, eyes still locked onto mine, teeth meringers from the skull of my beloved little dog. I began to reach, and it began to close its mouth around her. I swung my hand back to the wall, and it widened its sick mouth again, releasing Missy from its maw. I didn't know what to do. What could I do? Reach for my phone and risk it clamping down on my best friend? I could try to grab Missy, tear her away from this thing before it could do more damage, but the logical side of my brain knew I would never get there in time. She was so small. I could scream. If my dog didn't see this creature, who's to say anyone else would either? And it could strike before anyone even reached my room. So I did the most logical thing. Don't you dare hurt her, you hell beast, I seeded. Oh my sweet, I don't really want to, came the voice from the creature, dry and parched, words as broken as its legs in its mouth, struggled to make the necessary sounds for communication. You guessed it, I froze again. Its eyes stayed locked on me as it continued, smile still plastered across its mangy face. I don't want to hurt her, truly, but I will. Before I do though, I have a question for you. Your answer will determine her fate. It rasped out what could only be described as a laugh after its quandary, spittle dripping from its teeth. How much do you love her? Stay the hell away from her, I spat, and it smiled once again, slunk across its face as it broke into gaze to my and looked at Missy hungrily. That's not what I asked. I will hurt her, came the raspy voice once again. I love her more than anything. My body hurt. The adrenaline was waning into my desperation. Oh, that's just perfect, it crooned. Although I already knew that much, I could smell it. I jumped back as the thing once again did its mockery of a laugh, dry air being forced through the stagnant lungs. You see, I need something from you. You want my soul, I asked. At this, it threw its head up and heaved its sickening laugh even louder. I hoped it would choke. My sweet. I don't want your soul. It bared its teeth, glee flashing through its rotten face. Only then did I notice there was no whites to its eyes, only an inky black abyss. I want your legs. I stared, dumbstruck, as I remembered the way the thing crawled into my house, its legs forced out at all angles with every step. And if you don't give them to me, I'll kill her. I will rip her throat out and shred her little body while she drowns in her own blood. She can't see me, you know. She might even think it was you. Drool began to fall from its mouth as it coughed out the horrid words. You want my legs? My words were barely a whisper. Oh, don't worry. It won't even hurt. Well, not in comparison to what I'd do to her if you don't oblige. Its voice made me sick. My brain rattled through any other possible options. My human instinct for survival and the avoidance of pain screaming at me to deny its request. But I knew... What would happen to me, and Missy, had saved my life more times than I could count. I wouldn't let this thing kill her, not like this. Do it. The words were out of my mouth before I had time to react. Humans, so easily manipulated. Its eyes gleamed as it slowly unwound itself from Missy, dropping heavily onto its crooked legs, that popped and crunched under the weight as it dismounted my bed and deliberately made its way towards me. Its head rose for the first time, surveying my body before it locked eyes with me and opened its big mouth. I had just enough time to process the human tongue in place of the canine one that should have resided before it sunk its teeth into my tie and I blacked out. Losing my legs was tough. I lost friends, job opportunities and had to leave school for years to get my mental and physical health back on track. The doctors diagnosed it as a degenerative nerve disease, although they could never quite explain the sudden onset that left my legs entirely non-responsive to myself or to external stimulants. However, humans have a remarkable ability to adapt to their circumstances, and sooner than I thought I had adjusted to my new way of life. Missy lived for many more years and took her last breath at home in my arms, oblivious to the way her life almost ended. I never told a single soul about the creature I encountered inside my apartment that night or the deal I had struck with it during its her lifetime, lest it decide to pay me and Missy another visit. 
Therefore, I ask you, how much do you love your dog? Hell, maybe it's not only dogs, I don't know. How much do you love your pet? What are you willing to give up for them if you knew your sacrifice would save them from a terrible debt outside your own ability for comprehension? For me, Missy was everything and I would give anything within my power to secure her safety. I don't regret my choice. I beg you though, be careful with how much you love your tiny companions. There may come a day when you have to prove it. There was always this feeling of isolation whenever I was in my aunt's little cottage out in the countryside. I will tell you now, it was very quiet out there. There were very few cars on the roads and our neighbours were some miles away and the days usually went by there quite slowly, mostly for the reason that I couldn't entertain myself and was bored out of my tree. She never added Wi-Fi, nor did she have any electronics there. So no TV, computer, phone, there was nothing. I don't know how she could live like that, but she always was very friendly and tried to make me play board games with her. Her husband was dead, apparently died out in the Middle East and they had never had children. So I guess she saw me as one of her own and tried to always appeal to me. I think it would have been better if she had Wi-Fi. Now she had moved away. She's living in the city now due to her getting on a bit and getting a better job there. I still visit her at times when I can and on strange days I find myself driving back to the cottage. There's also that peaceful tranquility out there where the cottage is and I am drawn by its curious and longing for less noise. The house was bought by an elderly couple and they still live there to this day. There is another part of the cottage that has always confused me because I always remember being in that room even though my aunt had venomously denied me ever setting foot in there. I'm talking about the locked door to a room near the entrance of the basement. It was a solid wooden door that would always be locked and it just mystified me. You see, I have fond memories of playing in that room which was always unlocked with other kids, including this one kid that I can no longer find or contact, named Hugh Douglas. Now Hugh was a brilliant kid. The words intelligent and nerdy come to my mind whenever I think of that name. He was also quite clumsy and from my memories, I think overweight. We would play with whatever we got our hands on in that room and there was always something to do. There were so many toys in that room, all made by this strange metal machine that would create for us all sorts of weird and really I would call sentient gadgets. We called it the Maker. I assumed the adults, including my aunt, knew about the machine. But apparently when I told my aunt about this, she had seemed to whiten for a second, very subtle, before replying to me that she knew of no such thing ever existing in her cottage and if she did, she would have sold it or thrown it away. Whatever it was, the maker made our childhood lives a heaven. All of the toys and gadgets came from this tub that had a pipe dangling above it. There was this complex system of machinery in a corner of the room that seemed each day, from what I can remember, to have grown in size and shape. There was this area of the machine where it was just lots and lots of holes leading to somewhere deep within the maker. But at first, we had just ignored it. But after a week, Hugh figured out that the maker could listen to us if we put our requests on paper and dropped them through the holes. I don't know how he figured that out. So we did. And the first thing Hugh asked for was a dog. He dropped the paper in there and came a deep groan beneath the ground and then something wet splashed into the tub. Upon looking in the tub, we found a skinless creature that had metal screws and bolts inside of its body and the look of pain on its face still makes me squirm because I can still see it so clearly. That was the first thing we asked for and soon we found out that the maker cannot for living things as well as inanimate objects. We left the dog thing in the tub and soon it began to rot and stink. It was terrible time but you asked for some toys. I think one was a G.I. Joe and the other was a Barbie doll. We received them and it made the day better again. The next time we went into that room was two months later and the dead thing in the tub was gone. Either my aunt had taken it or it had been consumed by the maker. Our dolls began to talk and walk around after they were created and both Hugh and I were delighted and excited. The dolls each had their personalities and their interacted with us in a delightful manner. 
However, there were times where I would notice this growing animosity towards me by Hugh whenever he asked for something. It was like sharing was beginning to become a bit of a chore for Hugh and I think the maker really meant something to him. Perhaps a parent from which he had lacked. I don't think Hugh ever talked about his family. After three months or so, Hugh began to talk strangely about the maker. Once I was sick and decided to stay in my room and Hugh had gone with me into the room. Remember, we were still kids, perhaps right before our teenage years, and he told me on that day that the maker was gone. So from that point on, I simply avoided the room because Hugh had told me. I don't know why I listened to him, but I, I think of him as a friend and believed him. Hugh would play with me during his stay over at the cottage and we never mentioned that room again. At some point, Hugh disappeared from my memories altogether. It was sudden and I can't explain this lack of Hugh ever again. The room eventually became locked and schoolwork and a larger social life began to overtake me. Although there were strange noises that came from that room during this time, I stayed over at the cottage. Noises that still perplex me and keep me pacing the house at night when the homeowners are asleep because they sound like the laughter of a child. A laugh distinct and familiar. I'm not sure what I saw, but I want to share. Hopefully someone here will recognize it so I can reassure myself I'm not insane. I've been reading this book for a while, enough to give myself chills when I make my nightly walk home from work especially when I cut through the park by all the tall trees. But I keep reading, as it's the only thing that makes the long shifts at the library even slightly entertaining. That might have been my saving grace tonight. I've read enough of these stories and seen enough horror movies to know when something doesn't seem right in the dark, scary woods, you walk faster. And when something shrieks in the woods, you don't go and investigate, as that's usually the first person in the movie to get killed. As much as I appreciate the rising action of a good horror flick, I don't fancy taking part myself, but I diverse. As I was walking home tonight, I decided to take my usual detour because I had worked the late shift and I opened in the morning, so more sleep would be better. As I approached the park, I hesitated. Something had my hair standing on end more than usual. I chalked it up to reading too many stories during my shift and kept walking. I was passing the thickest part of the trees. I stayed on the past, the forest to my right. I heard an animal crying out. This was a cry from an animal dying, for sure. I had never heard anything nearly as piercing or bone chilling in my life. I hoped it was something caught by a coyote, and I also hoped I wouldn't run into said coyote. I kept walking, thinking happy thoughts of my warm bed to keep me mind off it. Less than a minute later, however, I came across a fox lying on its side, clearly dead, very close to the path. This didn't require any wandering to investigate, so I stopped for just a second. I know I'm really not listening to my own advice, but I really wasn't out of my way. This fox had been killed, slashing, slashes across its little body, and its tail had been pulled clean off. I thought the poor thing must have been wandering too close to a pack of coyotes. Now I'm really banking on this forest having coyotes. In a public park, Probably not. I don't know much about my local wildlife, I'll admit. But I grew up in a cabin in the woods with a brother, so I wasn't clueless. I kept walking, hoping to avoid the coyotes. I really wish I could have stopped my brain from rationalizing. But all that, that thinking about coyotes remember, reminded me of one fact. Coyotes kill for food. None of this fox was eaten. Killed almost surely for sport. So I started running. Faster. Out of the park sounded better. Must be dogs. I'm telling myself over and over and over again. That's when something caught the corner of my eye. I hear rustling in the trees, and despite my mind screaming not to, I turn my head. Something, something big is looking at me. I can only see the gleam of moonlight bounce off its eyes. But those eyes were high in the air than mine. And it wasn't in a tree. Now I'm running even faster. I hear the thing rustling in the trees and I swear it's getting closer. By some act of God, that's when a damn white-tailed deer runs out of the woods just in front of me, still off the path to my right, and gives me that deer in a headlight look. This thing, the eyes follow me, finally breaks the tree line. I was frozen from the deer, star startling me. And I watched as something tall, skinny and 
almost skeletal, run down the deer in front of me. I was frozen, but so was the whitetail. The deer must have been a better target because the creature lunged at it, slashing at it with those claws. This creature clawed the deer to ribbons before it finally stopped kicking, stopped making that awful noise. The creature only made this sound. It was guttural and hoarse, like something trying to clear its throat. It got louder when the deer finally died, almost triumphant. I had to be next, but this thing had outrun a deer. It was game over. However, instead, it started dragging the deer, first with its teeth, then standing on its two legs, it slung it over a shoulder and began sulking back into the woods. I took off, running, and didn't look back. Does anybody know what this creature might be? Okay, so here it goes. A month or so ago I recently moved into a new house and finished unpacking. Everything seemed fine at first, but after I found this strange book in the attic, things have been happening around the house. I think the book is haunted by a witch. I've gone to the person who sold me the house and they told me that there was an elderly lady that lived there before me and that she had stayed to herself and nearly come out. I've gone on to one of those places that have records of the area but I couldn't really find anything out of the ordinary about my new house. I believe it's a witch's book because of all the spells written in it. At first it was just random creaking noises throughout the house but now I'm finding doors open that I know for a fact were closed and lights turned on other parts of the house. After about a week or two I've started hearing footsteps either walking or moving at fast speed. When I'd go and check what was causing the noise I couldn't find anything but it always seemed to be in the same room as that book. The other day I tried getting rid of the book by throwing it out in the garbage but by the next day when I come home from work I found the book again laying on the nightstand next to my bed. No matter how much I try to get rid of it it always finds its way back to me somehow. So I've started going through the book to see what was in it and at first it seemed harmless because it had some minor spells and love letters to someone. The further I go into the book the spells started getting darker and darker and the letters seemed to be getting fewer and further apart. I've taken the book to a store that specialises in this kind of thing but they wouldn't even touch the book because they could feel some kind of dark presence coming from it and urge me to leave immediately. I'm starting to lose sleep because of this book and whatever it is attached to. I don't know if it's the spirit of the old lady that lived in the house before me or the former owner of the book has cursed it with the soul of a demon. Whatever has been done to this book I still need to find a way to get rid of it because I feel like my mental and physical state are going downhill since I first opened this book. I've tried throwing it out, I've tried destroying it, but the book doesn't seem to get damaged no matter what I do. At night, I feel like I can hear voices and that I find that book open to a spell. The voices are subtle though and it's coming from outside. So until I found out where the voices are coming from, I'm going to assume it's coming from the neighbor's house. If anyone can help me, give me some kind of advice on how to get rid of this book, I'd be forever in your debt. My name is Stevie, I'm a 28 year old and I'm a nurse in the Abnormal Conditions Department. Let me take a wild guess and say you've never heard of it, am I right? Of course I am, because the ACD is completely hidden from the public. The only people who know about it are those who work in it, and we're required to sign a contract stating that we can never tell anyone about it. Not that we would want to, and it's not like anyone would believe us either. But let me take you back to where it all begins. Please note, I'm going to change my name and the name of the hospital for obvious reasons and redact any identifi identifiable information. I know that doesn't mean much coming from a stranger on the internet, but you have my word. These stories are true. In the three years that I have worked in the ACD, I've changed my entire outlook on life. It's bleak, it's scary, and it's so depressing. I finished nursing school with bright eyes and a promising future. I put in every ounce of effort into my studies because nothing made me feel as complete as when I was helping people. I knew I was destined to be the medical field, so when I landed an interview at Lakin's Memorial, it's safe to say I was absolutely psyched. The building was old, leaky, and the fluorescent lights flickered and buzzed. The previous white tiles were stained a light yellow, and the wheels of the hospital bed squeaked and groaned with each use. The hall smelled like old cleaning supplies and hand sanitizer. You're qualified for sure, the interviewer spoke in a tired, croaky voice. 
her deep red lipstick had all but vanished, leaving behind a slight smear and I tried not to stare at it. But you're fresh out of nursing school and we usually look for someone with at least a few years of experience. She didn't look up at me as she lazily laid my resume on the desk, letting out a bored sigh. The overhead lights buzzed and I shifted uncomfortably in the hard metal chair. Please, I leaned forward, trying to grab her attention. I don't have to work in the emergency department. I can help out anywhere you need me. And that's what sealed my fate. I was hired onto the ACD, not knowing what other hell I had just signed up for. Here's a quick rundown of the abnormal conditions department. Once you're in this department or ward, you're not leaving. The conditions these patients have isn't something that can be cured, diagnosed, or even understood. If you're admitted, you're going to die here. It's just the way it is. The ACD is located on the sixth floor of the hospital and you have to be authorized to even step three foot off the elevator. I was given a badge with a specific code on it, which was kept in a locked room on the first floor of the hospital. The only person who had access to the key was the ACD supervisor. The existence of this ward was completely classified and if any information was given to someone outside the ward, that spelled trouble not only for you, but anyone you told. So please, don't ask questions that may help you discover the hospital I'm talking about or the real identify of any of the patients. It's for my safety and yours. It's not a huge department, but there is an entire dehem de dedicated to ensuring that the families of the patients and any of the general public do not know the truth about what happened to their loved ones. I'm not sure if other hospitals have this sort of department, but I assume they do. It can't just be our city that deals with things like this. Although, even if other ACDs did exist, it's not like we're allowed to know anyway. I want to get something straight though. Our ward is not for studying, testing or experimenting on patients. Our sole job is to ensure that they are comfortable and away from the general public. Each patient comes to us as a last resort. The other departments are to do everything in their power to help. They're sent to us if there's absolutely nothing they can do to explain what's going on. Each person you hear about underwent numerous tests, scans, therapies, even operations to try to get a diagnosis, but nothing was ever found to be the cause. Thus, they were sent to us. Anyway, let's talk about a few of our patients. George was older, about 65 years old, when all of the bones in his body began to hurt. I don't mean ache, like a joint pain or arthritis, but hurt as in he could feel his muscles move against his bones. Every movement was like sandpaper over an open wound. He screamed in agony whenever he was conscious. Think of it like this. Have you ever had a really bad sunburn? One that hurts you even when the wind blows on it? Now imagine feeling that inside your body, everywhere, all the time. George came to us on a Wednesday, and by Thursday he was perpetually unconscious. Legally, we're not allowed to assist death in any way, but painkillers didn't work. Nothing worked. In the end, all we could do was keep him in a coma and hope that he couldn't feel anything. One night, out of nowhere, his spine cracked, broken half. His monitor went crazy, and a piece of bone was sticking out of the centre of his back. I remember blood soaking the sheets of his bed, and I worked to try to stop the bleeding as best I could, but there was no pressure on his spine. He wasn't even conscious, but there was somehow enough force to break the bone and puncture his skin. George passed not long after that. That's one of the tamer stories. A few months after I began working there, a young woman was admitted. Her name was Sue Carson. She was 19, worked at the local mall, and had a pretty engagement ring on her finger. One morning, she woke up to what felt like, in her words, ants crawling inside my eyes. It's like when your hand goes numb and feels prickly, but in my eyes. She also reported the sound of her legs crawling around and being so loud it made it impossible to hear us when she spoke. We had to keep her hands wrapped up because she would constantly try to scratch her eyes out. We thought it was mental, but according to her files she didn't respond to any medication or therapy. She wouldn't eat and drove herself crazy. There were no bugs, but she wouldn't believe us. Sue committed suicide one night during a shift change. I won't go into how, but we had an autopsy done on her, as we do with all our patients. On the inside of her eye sockets, there were tiny, microscopic scratch marks. It looked like someone took a needle and made thousands of little marks. Another patient was Marcus. His symptoms started off similar to a terrible cold or flu. Fever, runny nose, cough, then nausea and aches. Then his fever kept getting worse and worse. I go down, 
then right back up in it in a matter of hours. After they tried everything to break his fever, he was admitted to the ACD. Seems silly, right? It's just a fever. No, he was starting to hallucinate. He began having seizures. Ice baths did nothing. It was like his internal temperature wasn't phased by all the cold or medication. After a while, small blisters formed on his skin, then those turned into massive burns all over his body. Knocking him unconscious didn't slow his fever though, and a fatal medication dose was accidentally injected into his IV bag. I'm pretty sure another nurse couldn't bear to see Marcus get any worse. Not that I blamed him. By the time he was pronounced dead, his internal organs had already began to liquefy. Well, I think that may be enough for tonight. Recounting these events is starting to make me anxious, so I think I'll stop here. I don't like to remember what these people went through, but it does feel good to finally vent and put thoughts into words. It feels like a weight being lifted off me, and I'm not sure why typing it out helps, but having this pent up was starting to drive me crazy. Anyway, thanks to whoever is listening to this, I made it all the way to the end of my self-therapy session. Working in the medical field can be so satisfying and amazing, but whatever you do, don't ever accept a job in the NACD. My school wasn't the type of school to do activities. You know, it wasn't the American type school that has lots of clubs and lots of activities. Six hours a day, you go there, learn stuff, you go home. You know, you had your own classroom. The teachers need to come to you, so I guess it's more like an American school. It was very unusual where we were told we were going to have a sleepover at school. You know, some activities with the choir and then each class did whatever they liked. We prepared some popcorn in a microwave and watched a movie. We were sleeping in sleeping bags each, and I think by 11pm we were all asleep. I woke up at around 3am. Well, not around, at exactly 3am. I went to the bathroom slowly as not to disturb anyone. We had a big clock in our classroom. When I got back, it was still showing 3am, although I had been in the bathroom for at least 5 minutes. The hands weren't moving on the clock. I thought, sure, it ran out of battery. Kind of strange ran out of battery exactly 3am, but whatever. I got my phone out to check the time, but it didn't open. It wasn't out of battery, the buttons just weren't pressing. I thought it was strange, and I was a bit freaked out. I don't have the best phone, but still, you don't want to get it broken. My parents would go mad. I went over to my friend to try wake him. That's when my heart stopped. He didn't wake up. And it's not just that. The blankets, his hair, his sleeping bag, they weren't moving. They were like stone. I thought I was dreaming, but figured out I wasn't because I could actually feel everything. I tried waking everybody up, but they were like frozen in time. I tried moving out chairs and tables, but it didn't work. For some reason, only the doors worked, so I just tried to go outside. And sure, they figured it would be a good idea to lock the doors. You know, kids are kids after all. I tried to wander around the halls, trying to figure out what was happening. That's when I heard whispers coming from the teacher's office. I was thrilled when I figured out. The whispers weren't language. They were, they were just whispers. I peeked around the door just to see a monstrous figure with multiple tongues sucking on a teacher's head. That had a hole in it. It was like a slender man, but with no white skin and naked. I'd know what's going on, but I need to do something, I thought. What am I going to do? Wake up my friends? The only thing I was able to do was trying to survive. I tipped off to the hallways, peeking around the corners. The creature got out of the office and started wandering around in the classrooms. But it wasn't eating anything. Like the teacher had a hole in his head, I think it was searching for something. I don't know what. I thought that if I were to go back to sleep, it would skip our classroom just like it did the others. I went as slowly as I could, at the same time trying to hurry up. I got to my classroom, got to my sleeping bag, which weirdly wasn't frozen. The creature entered the classroom after two or three minutes. Of course, the time wasn't moving, but I think that was it. It wandered in a bit, then left. I sighed it with my heart racing. I tried to peek out over the hall. I never felt a greater regret. The creature was facing me about 30 or 40 metres in the hallway. It started charging at me, and my fight or flight instinct activated. I don't believe in God, but I think he blessed me that night, or so I thought. Our window was open, summer being, it was hot during the summer. I never sprinted faster. I jumped out and hit my head on the pavement. We were on the first floor, so it was like 20 metres of a free fall. I woke up in the morning in my sleeping bag. The police were all around the school. Got the news from my best friend. The teacher was found dead in the office, but no hole in his head. It was just like he had a heart attack or something. 
He was intact, but he was dead. I haven't told anyone about this, well until now. I didn't know what the creature was, but I have a theory. I think the teacher stayed up late in the office, and I woke up at the exact time for time being frozen. I can't imagine what would have happened if I was on the ground floor that night.